button. We are going to record. We are recording. Thank you so much. So uh, officially, welcome. Uh, my name is Mike Madison. I am a law professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, and I am the host of this workshop series on the future of law and technology. Uh, this is hosted by, and all of the administration is supported by Pitt's Center for Governance and Markets. So uh, thanks as always to the center and their leadership and their team uh, for uh, encouraging and supporting this workshop project. I am absolutely thrilled today to present our final speaker of this academic year, my friend Danielle Citron, who is a senior law professor at the University of Virginia. And I am not going to catalog all of her amazing biography and record, except simply to note that she is an astonishingly prolific and fun and interesting and productive and influential scholar of technology law and privacy in particular. Uh, she has a new book coming out very, very soon. And uh, as I said in a different meeting earlier today, uh, the timing of the topic uh, could not be better or worse, depending on your point of view. Uh, but uh, I don't want to give away anything about what Danielle's actually going to talk about. So I will simply turn the mic over to her. She's going to give a presentation uh, for about 20 to 30 minutes. And, and at that time, we'll uh, turn it over into a question and answer, uh, which I'll moderate and we'll carry on until uh, an hour from now. So Danielle, thank you very much for joining us today. And the floor is yours. Mike, thank you so much for having me, both to you and Brian, for making this happen. And for all of you, I know you students, you must be exhausted. You're in the middle of finals that you came at all is completely amazing to me. Uh, thank you so much. So I'm going to talk a bit about my book called The Fight for Privacy, Protecting Dignity, Identity, and Love in the Digital Age. And it comes out in October. Uh, uh, so it's not out yet. Um, and so, and unfortunately, I feel like with the leaked opinion in Dobbs, the book is not about decisional privacy. Um, and I'll explain in a second that it's the story of information privacy or intimate privacy. Uh, but of course the Dobbs decision, if indeed it looks like it does, and I'm so happy to talk about this in the Q&A, will have massive implications for the kinds of collections of intimate information that I'm gonna describe. So, so um, I would love us to, you know, we're gonna keep, I'll, I'll allude to it a bit in the talk, but but I'm sure in Q&A we will, we'll, we might dig in a bit more. Um, so I'm, uh, my work is about intimate privacy. And, and by that, I mean the, pri how we manage the boundaries around our intimate lives. So um, the extent to which others have access to and information about our bodies, our minds, our innermost thoughts, our, our searches online, our reading habits, um, our sex, sexual orientation and gender, and our closest relationships. Um, and it's of course, all of it's uh, in our physical spaces, it's on and offline, and it's the social norms, the, the attitudes, the expectations, and, the, and it's normative as well. Not only descriptive intimate privacy, it's the intimate privacy that we expect and want and that we deserve. Now, intimate privacy um, is a foundational privacy interest. You know, there's lots of different types of privacy. So you say, okay, my bank account information, it's really important uh, and in the hands of a thief uh, can be quite destructive, but it doesn't have the same kind of tentacles throughout all of your lives, like central parts of how we think of ourselves, our identities, um, our, our, our sense of self-esteem and social esteem, our ability to love, you know, our bank account information doesn't do that, but our information about our intimate lives does. So let me just, I'm gonna explain why intimate privacy matters, how I'm gonna give you some illustrations, vis-a-vis um, -vis individuals, companies, and just quickly about the government, um, why law doesn't do much to protect it and how we ought to think about intimate privacy. Um, and fundamentally, I argue that it ought to be understood as a civil right. Uh, and by that, I mean that we each and every one of us deserves, as well as structural protections against discrimination um, for the reasons that I'm gonna discuss in a second. Okay, so why does intimate, why does the ability to manage the boundaries around our bodies, our, our minds and our searches, our you know, sexual activity, our gender, our closest relationships, why does it matter? You know, our body is our first 
form of reference to figuring out who we are, right? And we need time alone with our bodies and with trusted others to figure out our gender, our sexual orientation, right? To have a sense of ourselves, right? And that ultimately we'd be willing to share with um, society or groups at large. And there's a piece of intimate privacy that has to do with human dignity. And by that term, it's kind of a vague term, I mean, our sense of self-respect. That is when we can manage the boundaries around our intimate lives, we have a sense that we're in control, right? Of our destinies and no slides. Um, the question was, are there any slides? Nope, I'm hopefully exciting enough. Uh, and, and our human dignity also understood as social esteem. That is the kind of respect that the ability to be seen as a fully integrated whole person rather than just a body part, right? And love, right? Love relationships, close relationships, and not just intimate relationships, but our closest relationships develop as we share our inner lives with each other. It's like uh, peeling back an onion. Um, social psychologists talk about the way in which we develop close relationships is we make ourselves vulnerable to other people. And we share our parts of ourselves that we're not going to share with other people. And it's only when we trust that other person to keep our confidences discreet that we can fall, both fall in a deep friendship and love. Um, but we've got to trust that they're going to keep our confidences with care. And we're only going to do that if we think they're going to treat our inner life, what we share with them, as we hope rather than as we fear. So that's the why we care, why is intimate privacy so important? It's because it's central to figuring out who we are, our identities and developing authentic identities to human dignity and then to our capability of developing intimate relationships. Or as Charles Fried said in 1970 in a wonderful book called The Anatomy of Values, he said, privacy is the oxygen for love. And he was ever right. So let me tell you about the different ways that people invade each other's or violate each other's intimate privacy. And I'm going to give you one example uh, uh, of a privacy invader in individual companies, which is going to be really on our minds today, and then government and, and companies as the handmaidens to government. So, you know, we invade people's intimate privacy in all sorts of ways. And you have likely of course, have thought about video voyeurism that is secretly taping someone in the bedroom or bathroom in ways that you know they don't want or anticipate or consent. Um, we there's something called sextortion, where you have a nude image of someone and that you demand that they give you more, or you threaten to post that information online. Upskirt photos, down blouse photos, you know, in public, someone places a camera or a camera hidden in a, in a watch or a sneaker up your skirt, it's quite common. Um, Non-consensual intimate imagery, that is the posting of someone's intimate images online and deep fake sex images. Those are just illustrations, of the ways in which individuals violate each other's intimate privacy. So I'm just gonna give you one example. Um, Joan, I'm gonna call her Joan, that, that's not her real name. Joan um, was staying in a hotel in New York um, for work. She was giving a deposition uh, the next day. And when she gets home from her trip, she gets an email. And the email just has a link to a video that says, send me more nudes or I release this to your friends and colleagues. And she clicks on it. And it's a video that's been posted to Pornhub of her showering and going to the bathroom. And so she asks me, what do I do? I said, you're not sending more nudes. This is an attempted extortion. Right. She doesn't send the nudes in the 24 hours that he demands. And so he sends the video and emails it to all of her LinkedIn contacts. So that's all of her law school classmates and friends, all of her coworkers. Um, and he posts it, or we are presuming it's a he, it's probably a hotel employee. And how he got her emails, likely it's an employee of the hotel, posts it on uh, countless adult sites. Now, Joan is able to get in touch with a few sites. Most ignore her, right? She has the ability to sort of file up, please take this video down. Most ignore her. Um, Pornhub helps her for, for a bit. And then just she finds her annoying because he keeps, he's very determined. He keeps putting up the video. There are about 9,500 sites devoted to non-consensual intimate imagery. So video voyeurism, sextortion, deep fake sex videos, right? Uh, and we'll talk about why those sites exist. They're mostly hosted in the United States. Um, and we're going to talk about a federal law that provides an immunity from responsibility. Why those sites helps explain why those sites are largely based in the United States. So that's the um, privacy invader story. And to put a fine point on it, 
most victims of non-consensual intimate imagery are women, their gender and sexual minorities and non-whites, and often on an intersectional basis. Um, the perpetrators are off, often male, though not always, but the victims are near, nearly always female or gender and sexual minority. So there are sites devoted to gay, bi, and trans you know, men, or really trans women with male genitals. There are sites devoted to women, right? Um, uh, women of all type and stripe. Um, okay, so that's the privacy invader violation story, what that looks like. What I call spying ink, that is companies massively over collect our intimate information, right? So period tracking apps, right? Femtech, one third of all women and girls in, in the United States use some form of a fertility or period tracking app. Um, which collects an enormous amount of information about us, not just, you know, when you had your period, did you get your period? Did you not get your period? And how are you feeling? But also, did you have sex? Who'd you have sex with? Did you orgasm, right? It's an ex extraordinarily intrusive amount of information that period tracking apps collect and often require that in order to use the service. Um, porn sites, adult sites, just take Pornhub. It's one of the biggest, it's got 42 billion visits a year. So can you imagine like that's everybody's basically <laughs> visited Pornhub. They collect our searches. They collect all the videos that we watch, how long we watch, how long we've scanned and looked at a video for. And just, I'm just giving some illustrations of the ways in which our intimate information is collected. Um, and just take the Alexa, right? The Alexa in your, or Echo in your kitchen um, often over collects information. Um, there have been studies that show that, that Alexa has false positives of a significant rate. So Alexa has tape people having sex, um, talking about their prescriptions, business meetings, right? Um, so all of that intimate information is monetized, right? We, it's deceptive. These companies say are, are, you know, these services are largely very cheap or free, but they're not free, right? The information is shared and monetized and sold. And there are 4,000 data brokers that create dossiers about in the United States, all over the world, but 98% of Americans have dossiers that include detailed information. There are apparently 10,000 data points on each and every one of us, which you might say like, how is there 10,000 data points about me? What's so interesting, right, about me? And they rank and rate and score people as rape victims, um, as having had abortions and miscarriages. They rate and rank people as sex toy users. Um, so, so the most intimate aspects of our lives, whether we have HIV, uh, dating apps, you know, you can imagine how much information is shared on dating apps. If you look at Grindr and Tinder's privacy policy, it's an anti-privacy policy. It says we're selling and sharing that information, right? Data brokers have their hands on that data. Okay, so that's the trying to make sure I get through everything I want to share with you. So that's the spying ink story, right? Privacy invaders will often go to spying ink, the data broker to buy information about you. Each is a handmaiden of the other, right? Each, each will dip into each other's reservoirs and fuel one another, right? Okay. So government surveillance. Now I, in the book, talk about um, ways in which government invades people's intimate privacy. And sometimes it's just like bureaucratic surveillance. Uh, and sometimes like in the case of Donald Trump, um, who uh, exploited text messages between Lisa Page and Pete Strzok, um, exposed them, the Department of Justice leaked them to uh, employees in order to discredit the Russia investigation. Both were civil servants, basically FBI agents, one uh, FBI counsel, the other FBI agent. Uh, and he turned their text messages, some that included some criticisms of Trump, uh, in, into a spectacle. Uh, and so, you know, we have seen, so, so the penultimate in, intimate privacy invader, of course, are, are the intimate compromise of the Soviet Union, right? Um, it's the playbook that, that Putin refined, it's why he's president, that's why he's the head of Russia today, right? He started his career um, by faking a sex video of the prosecutor who was investigating Yeltsin's corruption. And in faking the sex video, the prosecutor is removed from the case. And as a, as a KGB officer, uh, basically Yeltsin said, I owe you one, Putin. And he then becomes, so this is a very tried and true story, right? The in, use of intimate compromise 
to jeopardize and, and to you know, um, defang threats um, is also a strategy that uh, unfortunately authoritarians use to silence journalists. Um, so Rana Ayub is a journalist um, in, in India. Uh, a deep fake sex video clip was released of her in April, 2018 because she had criticized the Modi regime one too many times. Um, and essentially she was driven in her home terrified to go outside. The deep fake sex video was on about half the phones in India within 48 hours. Her Twitter account had death, rape threats, included her home address, calls that for her rape, um, the suggestion she was available for sex and was a prostitute. And she essentially has not written in an Indian outlet since then, but she's been writing, God bless for the Washington Post, um, uh, and only did so though after a year, right? So she, what the Modi regime wanted to do was silence her, and it accomplished its goal uh, for at least a year's time. Okay, so that's the sort of landscape of um, privacy invasions, individuals, companies, governments, right? And I think what we can talk about is the ways in which women who use period tracking apps, and it's something I've talked about um, with some journalists in the last couple of days, is with the leaked draft, you know, the fear that period tracking apps are, you know, will be shared with government actors and states that criminalize abortion as proof that someone has missed a period, right? And then had a termination of a pregnancy. Um, so we are gonna see women not using these apps in those states that criminalize abortion. Um, and I think we have every right to fear uh, potential subpoenas and warrants. And we also have something called third party rule, which means lots of these, uh, it, lots of this information is essentially in the wild west. Government can just ask for it or buy it from data brokers. Okay, so what, what's up with the law, right? Why do I need to write a book? This is all horrible, right? But if law has, um, if there are tools in the toolbox, why don't we just use them? And the answer, unfortunately, is that we we are insufficiently, woefully unprotective in the United States. In fact, we're kind of scoff laws for the rest of the world. My book is about the global story of intimate privacy, and so the story of the privacy invader in the United States is the story of South Korea, is the story of Singapore, of Israel right, of, of Germany, right, uh, of France. Um, the same kinds of stories of privacy invaders, individual privacy invaders, unfortunately, is the same kind of story that we see across the globe. But in the United States, um, we don't have a comprehensive approach to the privacy invader, right? We, we um, have made some progress on the law in terms of the criminalization of non-consensual pornography uh, on the state level, but we don't have a federal law and we have a lot of work to do when it comes to individuals. But really where we're scoff laws is as to websites hosting intimate information and the collection use and sharing of our intimate data. You might say like, hey, what's up? Why not HIPAA, right? HIPAA does not cover period tracking apps, right? It's, a, it's basically a, a portability, insurance portability statute with like a sidecar of privacy, which only covers healthcare providers. It does not cover third-party apps. It doesn't provide any protections for most of the intimate information that we share with third parties. Dating apps, period tracking apps, porn sites, all of that can be shared and sold and to data brokers who then share and sell them to government, right? With very little to no protection. Um, and the reason why web, there are 9,500 websites um, that peddle in non-consensual pornography, hidden cam, you know, video threads and deep fake sex videos is thanks to a federal law passed in 1996 called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And the crazy thing is, you know, note the title, the Decency Act, right? The idea was to like rid the internet of porn. Now, most of the statute is struck down as unconstitutional as a criminal provisions that were overly broad. Uh, but what remained, the only piece of it that remained was Section 230. Now, the idea behind Section 230, a Republican and a Democrat, Chris Cox and Ron Wyden got together. Um, they had, there was a, two trial court cases that had found that websites that tried to monitor and filter dirty words actually opened themselves up to more liability, to strict liability as publishers uh, for defamation that appeared on their platform. And so Cox and Wyden wanted to incentivize companies to self-regulate. So they provided this legal immunity in Section 230 uh, for user-generated content. And the idea was that they called the statute Good Samaritan filtering or blocking of offensive content. 
And the idea was that good Samaritans, they would be free from responsibility if they filter too little or too much in good faith. Uh, and therefore they would put themselves out on the line and monitor. But what it's led to is very overbroad interpretations of the statute in the courts. And so websites that solicit illegality, that solicit intimate privacy violations, that make money from it, right? Those are completely immune from responsibility. So in some sense, we are the scoff laws that export harm all across the globe. Um, I have worked with the South Korean government and the Australian government, uh, and they said that, look, we can, we can pressure platforms in our own, hosted in our own countries, to remove nude images, it's posted without consent, of our you know, citizens of our country. But most of the photos are hosted on sites that are hosted in the United States. So there's nothing we can do, right? So Section 230 is a problem in the United States, but it's also a problem for nude images that can be viewed everywhere. That's the internet, right? Um, we also, in the United States, we take a consumer protection approach to privacy, which means that if so long as you have a so long as you have a privacy policy, and you don't lie in your privacy policy, you can collect, use, and share information. And Woody Hartzog, my dear colleague, uh, calls privacy policies anti-privacy policies, and he's right. Right. If you look, go check out Grinder. Go check out Tinder's. You know their privacy policy. They're telling you they're sharing that information with third parties, and they can because we don't have a comprehensive privacy law. Unlike in Europe, and they're not so great at it either. But the very least, they've got to get your explicit affirmative consent to collect, and then also separately to so sell or share your intimate information. They still can do it. Right. It's just very thin procedural protections in Europe and the UK but at least they have to ask you individually, right? So we have like woefully inadequate protections. And in my book, I argue that we ought to understand intimate privacy as a civil right. And by that term, I mean a right, and so I'm, I'm drawing on Robin West's work uh, and, and original understandings of, of the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which is a civil right is a right owed everybody. It's a fundamental human right. And it also, at least in my, the way I describe intimate privacy, provides protection against structural discrimination, right? Because we know that more often the victims of individually targeted um, and also given the way that gender norms and stereotypes operate, intimate information is gonna be more costly to women, gender and sexual minorities and non-whites. And so I, in my book, describe ways in which, and the reason why I say civil rights laws provide an important, not only expressive role, it teaches us it's important, tells us it can't just be traded away, right, without a good reason, our intimate information, that it can't be betrayed, right, without serious penalty. It also provides important practical tools because when um, entities are in charge of our civil rights, they have special responsibilities. They're the stewards of those rights, just as we think of, you know, schools and workplaces with important protections against uh, so the civil rights and important opportunities of individuals. And so viewing companies, governments um, as stewards and websites, as the stewards of our intimate information, flips the script and changes and should change how the responsibilities of the legal responsibilities and moral responsibilities of companies of websites and of governments. So I know I have to leave time for questions. So 25 minutes, Mike, on the figure, this is enough of an appetite for us to hopefully have questions for me um, that, and I'm happy to just keep talking uh, about my legal agenda, my market agenda. I work a lot with companies and have for the last 12 years on content moderation and safety. We can talk about that. Um, and sort of strategies for educators as well. There's a lot we all can do and need to do and must do to protect intimate privacy. Wow. Well, okay. thank you. Uh, so lots to get into and I'll just lean back and uh, thank you, Danielle. And I see Isadora has raised her hand right away. Please, uh, if you are able to turn your camera on, that would be welcome. And, and if you would introduce yourself and uh, whatever question you'd like to ask Danielle, thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so uh, I apologize because I was uh, working. I had to uh, come into the chat a little bit late. 
but I really, so if you, if you address this in the beginning, please let me know, but I'll watch the recording later. Um, I want to get your thoughts on the uh, draft um, doing Roe v. Wade. I think yeah. it is important that it's been discussed. I mean, it, it's framed in terms of abortion rights, but yes. to me, there is a missed opportunity to engage beyond it as a women's issue or the other other sexual minorities impact or interracial marriage, et cetera, and to talk broadly about privacy as something we all have a stake in, whether or not we engage in any of the specifics that the draft mentions. Absolutely. So terrific question. And let me answer it first. I think that's you're absolutely right to sort of say that it's a societal concern, right? Not just a women's issue, but it's all of our issues because we're all in relationships and no loved ones, right? That is the ability to have bodily autonomy, make decisions, personal decisions about to keep a pregnancy um, or if your life is at risk and you need to terminate a pregnancy between a woman and a, you know, we don't, we don't get pregnant in a vacuum, right? Like, you know, so <laughs> is it what I take you to be saying, right? Like we don't do this on our own. It's not self-generating. That is we're in a, a web of relationships and networks. And of course, the, the, someone has helped impregnate us, right? And so the story of decisional autonomy is a story that of course, the question of the actual autonomy, physical autonomy, the person who's bearing the child is gonna be someone who can bear a child. So we're talking about people with um, uteruses, right? We're talking about women, um, but we are also talking, of course, inevitably about the web of relationships, right? That we have with other people. And so bodily autonomy has implications, of course, for our loved ones, the person with whom we had, whoever we had sex with, whoever impregnated us, right? And so the, the, the leaked, if we, the opinion is what we think it is, right? Even if it's slightly changed, right? But, but the notion that we don't have a right to bodily autonomy um, to terminate our pregnancies in decisions with our doctors. And my sister is an OBGYN. And as soon as the opinion leaked, she was like sort of out of her mind. She's uh, uh, luckily in New York, but that doesn't mean that she's not seeing patients flying in from Texas already, right? So, um, you know, the, the, the decision has implications, of course, more broadly than just gender, right? Than just women. It's, it's the story and, and the substantive due process implications, of course, has uh, going to have implications for contraception. Uh, if you think we're going to, the court is going to stop here of other un rights that are implied in the substantive due process, I think you've got another thing coming. I think decisions about who we can love, who we can marry, they're on the line as well. But I, for my work, Isadora, what also comes into picture is the collection of our intimate information is gonna be weaponized against us, right? So, you know, your period tracking app, it collects and knows, um, you know, your cycles and whether you've gotten your period and has you, and if you, are, you miss a period, right? That's also included in the app and can be used. Governments can demand, state governments that are gonna criminalize abortion can demand access either via subpoena or warrant for that information. So your, what, what we understand as a period tracking app is meant to help us, right? Uh, we have autonomy over our bodies and understand how our bodies are working. And I always think they're like, I always wish that I could say to my kids, totally use them. I have two young daughters, you know, 20 and one and two, you know, 24. I can't tell them to do it because there isn't a sense either that that information isn't being sold. And now the stakes are even higher, right? That information can be either through the third party doctrine, you don't even need a subpoena, you just ask for it, right? There is no reason why a period tracking app can't just give it to them, right? To state prosecutors or investigators. So my deep worry, of course, is the fact that we're denied this opportunity to make decisions about ourselves in states that criminalize or penalize the practice, right? And the chilling effect that it has and how it fundamentally changed your life, but also has massive implications for the kinds of intimate information that we share with companies and how that information is going to be shared with prosecutors and with investigators and weaponized against us um, for something that should be just between us and companies, us and our doctors, and no one else should know about. 
So I hope that answers your question, Isadora. I know I went on my own intimate privacy and, uh, you know, sort of um, as someone who's not a uh, my first thing this you'll enjoy because as a young student, my 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 note for law school was about Casey, Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And in 1993, the article came out and it was about how the shift in Casey from like a rights talk, sort of very the rights holder as being alone in her choice to a more responsibility talk that was more European. And so I argued then that if we're gonna move in this more responsibility talk if we're going to talk about abortion as as between communities, then we should bear responsibility for them in the way, same way that Europe does. Well, unfortunately, right? If this draft is what it is, bye bye Casey, bye bye Roe. Like no responsibility talk, right? We just don't have we. It's as if the time of the writing of the Constitution, women didn't have rights, and now it looks like if we understand ordered liberty to be about history and tradition, and if we're back at the time of the framing. We, we couldn't vote, right? We're not going to have rights. So I, I am, I'm truly, I'm with everyone who's so devastated. Like I, I had to, the, the day after I read, I was spent all night reading and then doom scrolling on Twitter. I don't know about you, but I, um, I had spent the next day in bed. I just like, I, I, just the thought for young people, for all of you, right? I'm sort of past that point of, of my life. But, but everyone else I love, as you said really well, we're not lo- alone in all of this, right? We have communities of young people who we love. Um, and so I'm worried. Thank you so much for the question. I was hoping to talk about it. Okay, so we have Jacob next and then a couple yeah. of questions in the chat. Jacob. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, um, great. Great. Um, so, hi, my name is Jacob. I'm a privacy engineering student. And um, before I started here, I was studying misinformation at the University of Texas. Um, mm, yeah. And uh, so when I think about how the data that is weaponized against us, I, I think about also how it is used to sort of hyper target the narratives that lead to laws and decisions like this. Um, yeah. And and I was interested, I was, you were talking about Section 230 earlier and the, the factions that sort of support the sort of systematic disinformation have really weaponized 230 as like a flashpoint Mm -hmm. um so how do you think what do you think is the proper way to talk about that to discuss the the right to privacy and the protection of women and minority groups without falling into those narrative traps that have been set by the more like um by the right-wing um movements that are rising around us Right. So I'm going to tell you a bit about my proposal for how to fix Section 230. But before I do, um, you're right that there are sort of like two pretty, um, Marianne Franks and I have written about the sort of myths that confound Section 230 reform. And there's one myth, which is that, you know, thanks to Section 230, we have an over censorship of conservative speech. Now, it's, it's unclear that that's true at all as a factual matter, right? But companies make decisions. So Section 230C2 says that if you in good faith remove speech, that you're not going to be responsible for the removal of that speech. But these are private companies. And so in some sense, Section 230 is just re-inscribing what the First Amendment allows. Like, you can't say that Twitter's not the government, right? Facebook's not the government. They owe you nothing, right? They can decide on their platform what kind of information they, in their terms of service and speech policies, what they're going to tolerate and host. And so Section 230, yes, it is like a stalking horse. You know, Trump said, we should get rid of Section 230. Well, he would not be too happy because he would definitely never go back on Twitter and Facebook because then they would be responsible if he if we got rid of 230 completely, then Facebook and Twitter and whoever else platforms would be responsible for his defamation, <laughs> right? Right. So defamatory lies, right? Um, Section 230 immunizes platforms from from sort of publisher liability as well as distributor liability, and so the complaints on the right about Section 230 is that it it permits so much censorship, and that who's being censored are often the speech that I like, you know, like, um, you know, the conservative speakers say like they're being censored when in truth, they're probably violating platforms, hate speech laws, right? They have hate speech policies. Um, So that's the one misperception about section 230. The other is that section 230 requires platforms to be neutral as if they're like a common carrier. 
And that's not true at all. Section 230 encourages, provides a legal shield in the hopes that companies act as good Samaritans blocking and filtering of offensive content. That's the title of the, that's the title of Section 230C, right? And so, you know, the Jacob, you asked about, so I'm going to tell you my solution or my reform proposal in a second, but you asked about disinformation and misinformation, right? The problem of disinformation and misinformation in the United States, lies are legally protected speech unless the falsehoods cause harm that implicates law that's of longstanding tradition, right? So defamation, you can sue over lies. You can sue, you know, you can be prosecuted for impersonating a government official. But there's a whole lot of lying that you can't be sued for, right? Health disinformation. Maybe Congress could draft that statute, but it hasn't, right? There's a whole lot of disinformation and misinformation, um, even lies about elections, like where you can show up. We should regulate that. We don't yet, right? And so Section 230, it's less 230, I think, than the data model, the, the business model of is targeted advertising, right? So the more you like, click, and share, the more money you make. And Section 230 allows you to host anything and everything. And so the more salacious, even the more illegal, keep it. Because if it keeps people engaged, right? If they like, click, and share, then you make money, right? So, so in a way, disinformation and misinformation are a really tough problem, right? Because it's often, in, it's often speech that we protect in the United States. So even if you remove Section 230, that you took, got rid of the immunity, We'd, st we'd still see a lot of disinformation because you can't walk, you, you can't sue for about it, right? It's legally protected speech. Now, I propose, and I've long proposed since 2008, that, that platforms, and this is consistent with co conceiving platforms as data stewards, as civil rights bear, that, that they owe us, they are the protector of our civil rights, is that they should take, and I Ben Wittes and I have crafted statutory language and I've testified before Congress um, twice about my proposal that they take reasonable steps to address illegality that causes serious harm. That would incentivize platforms, right, to engage in what I've seen develop over 12 years working with companies of so those reasonable practices that have developed on the ground in online safety and content moderation. It's a, it's a huge field. They even have their own professional association. And so um, I, I think we keep Section 230, but we condition it on taking reasonable steps to address illegality that causes serious harm. Thank you. You're welcome. So Mike, you want me to look in the chat or do people wanna? Unmute myself, sorry. Yeah, we've got several in the chat. Um, I, I have a comment from Bishwa, but that came directly to me. So let me uh, invite Bishwa if you want to unmute yourself and, and ask a question or or uh, would prefer that I rephrase in a library. Ah, so let me rephrase Bishwa's question briefly. Sure. Uh, so Bishwa asks about data localization. So Danielle, you were yeah. talking about, uh, you know, different you know, the, the fact that this is a fragmented landscape, and but it's an, a global problem with the different international implications because of the yeah. localization of a lot of the content in the US, but a lot of different privacy uh, frameworks in a lot of different countries. So would data localization practices or data production law in different countries, would that make the problem, would that address the problem or would it make it worse? Okay, so there are two separate things, right? The data localization laws, which we see in India and Russia and China, which require that you hold data about its own citizens that you, when you provide them products and services, that you hold it and store it and host it in servers in that country. And it's basically the authoritarian's best kept secret, right? Like if you require that the data of your citizens be held in your country, then you just can take it, right? Authoritarians need, they don't need to go to the United States and have you know, uh, uh, um, an MLAT, you know, like you, if you have to store um, cit uh, citizens data that's being collected by a company, if you've got to store it in that country, it'll, it enables government to have easy access to that data. And that's often what's behind data lo localization laws in Russia and China and India. Okay. So separate question from the legal protections, right? 
of in, in countries outside the United States. Now, in Europe and in the United Kingdom, which of course after Brexit has its own version of the exact same, the, the general data protection regulation, so GDPR, we're all very familiar with it. And if you remember in May, 2018, when GDPR, um, it's May 25th, I think, becomes operable, we all got those emails saying, hey, do we have your consent to have your data, right? And like the most meaningless experience those thousands of emails, right? We all clicked yes, figured we had to, because that's the case in the United States, we don't have a choice. GDPR has their protections, unfortunately, are pretty thin, right? They are procedural protections that we know that we are asked, right? There are like six different grounds for legitimate collection and processing of information. One of them is consent, right? You've got to get explicit affirmative consent from individuals to gather their information. You've got to give them a real choice, meaning they can say no and still have use of the service. Most people, uh, they it's like, so they don't want any friction. They say yes. Um, you also, if you want to share someone's information, you've got to get permission from them. Um, there's also modes of accountability. Like if you, you can go to a provider and say, delete my information, it's a version of the right to be forgotten. It's a data minimization. You can request a right to delete your data. But a lot of this is on individuals to so invoke their rights. And do we do it? No, <laughs> right? It's very hard because you can't ask requests to delete at scale. We, sh we should have that. I, I talk about that in my book, but we don't. And so the protections in Europe are, are often like, oh, we'd be better off if we had GDPR. And the answer is no, we wouldn't, right? They are pretty thin procedural protections and they don't have the substantive protections. They don't have duties of loyalty. They don't have duties of care that I argue a civil rights approach uh, would so require. Great. Uh, next in the queue, Kate Vargish, did you want to... Uh to ask your question. Um, sure, yes, hi. Um, I'm actually, I'm a staff member here at CGM and um, I've really been enjoying this talk, but you know, at the same time, and I did put this in the chat, it, it as a cis woman, it, it infuriates me and terrifies me at the same time that, that these systems can be used against us, especially, you know, systems that are really meant to improve our lives. Yeah. Um, and you know, my question is, in in layman's terms, I guess, is there any hope? <laughs> you know, are there any sorts of of laws or movements that are are attempting to um, to better protect us? Or you know, I guess a follow up would be, what are the systems that are trying to strike those laws down um, before they you know really bear teeth? That's my question. Right. So Kate, I think you're going to really like my book because chapter 10 is called Hope and Change. So I'm going to give you some three examples of what I think are hopeful, right? So the first um, I was involved in in the United States, um, I worked for our now vice president, but when she was the attorney general, Kamala Harris was her advisor for two years on privacy and what she calls cyber exploitation. So in 2014, um, she invited me to come give my first book called Hate Crimes in Cyberspace to her executive team. There are like five of them. And they said, we want to do something about non-consensual intimate imagery. We're going after site operators who are um, extorting people of like $500 to remove their photos. And section 230 does, that's what, that's extortion of these site operators, right? She's like, I know I can do that. But so she had criminal cases, but she's like, how can I? And so we talked about how and formed a cyber exploitation task force to see what we could do vis-a-vis -vis companies. And so we had a convening. She's so great at convenings. We had a convening. Um, uh, 50 companies came to um, uh, a teeny little room in the San Francisco um, office of the Department of Justice. Um, and we talked about what is non-consensual intimate imagery, what A.G. Harris called cyber exploitation, and how can we, that is, as a group, if interested, fix it. So we formed a task force. And four months later, there were announcements by Google and Yahoo that they would de-index non-consensual intimate imagery in searches of people's names. Clearly had some influence by, from Europe from the right to be forgotten decision, but absolutely they were part of our task force and it clearly had 
influence their self-governance, that is their self-regulation and decisions. Um, most of the folks on the task force banned non-consensual intimate imagery. So when we were done four months later, Twitter, you know, Reddit was actually first to the party banning non-consensual intimate imagery. Facebook, right? It was a story in which, you know, you had a pretty significant public person bringing companies together with advocates to say, go figure something out. Isn't there something that we can do in terms of self-regulation that I can encourage? And so, you know, we saw the banning of non-consensual intimate imagery on some of the biggest sites and for victims, the idea that you can ask Google to de-index non-consensual intimate imagery in your name is everything. All they, I mean, you can't avoid the harm that you've already suffered, but you can undo its continuation, right? So that was, I think, a really important moment. It's not everything, but I think it provides hope, right? The second example is from the UK. Um, so a, a woman named Gina Martin um, was at a concert uh, in 2018, and a man behind her with, with a group of guys took an upskirt photo. And she turned around because they were laughing, and she saw basically a picture of her vagina on his phone. And she basically grabbed the phone. She's really a brave human being and ran to a, a police officer who basically like felt really bad, but said, there's nothing we can do to help you. And, and he was right. The laws in the UK just like did not touch up, upskirt photos. Um, and it's also true of the United States. Um, and, you know, Gina went about the process of trying to change the law herself. So she's t- she told me, and I recount in the book, she Googled how to change a law. Like <laughs> that's, She was like a PR advertising person. So she connected with a lawyer. Um, she ran a public campaign. She was really good at advertising. And within a year and a half, um, the UK banned upskirt photos. And really the turning point was when MPs were going to like strike down the bill that had been proposed. But what happened was there was um, coverage of an event at a posh uh, elite school. Uh, a teacher was taking upskirt photos of young girls at the school they, and they had to wear skirts. Um, you know, it was like a, it's a posh private school. So they had to wear like skirts as part of their uniform. And as Gina explained to me, like the MPs, some of these MPs were like, I'm not a feminist. I'm not behind you. This is, you know, like, it's your fault for wearing a skirt basically at a concert. Like, why weren't you more careful? They changed their tune after the story about, you know, basically potentially their grandchildren, right. Being upskirt photos taken of their, of up their skirts of children, right. On the playground. Um, and so, you know, the UK uh, passes this law um, banning upskirt photos and then has now is doing an overhaul on all of its intimate imagery. Is There's a commission that's studying reform of the criminal laws around the non-consensual use of intimate imagery. So like as individuals, we can do something. It doesn't have to just be a charismatic AG getting advocates together, right? Um, and then the story of, Sing- of South Korea, which I just find is, it's incredible. So South Korea has a very serious problem with hidden cameras in women's public bathrooms. Um, and it's often referred to as Molka, which is like after um, a TV show, like a hidden camera TV show. And it's kind of, it's almost a jokey form. It's how we often in the United States would refer to revenge porn. Advocates, we hated that term. It made it seem like it was the victim's fault, right? South Korea had the same problem. They were, it was a problem that was trivialized, it was widespread. Um, women would go to the bathroom and they'd have to buy these $20 Molko kits, which would, which would have like, you would be able to have a little screwdriver so you can screw in any holes that you found in the bathroom and silicon, like silicone gel, and you'd have masks. This is before the pandemic, you know, so that you would wear a mask so that you couldn't be recognized if you were videotaped going to the bathroom in, in public, you know, going to a public bathroom. And at some point, this was in April of 2018, 50,000 women got together in, on the streets of Seoul to protest. And the sign said, my life is not your porn, right? Three months later, 80,000 people took to the street in Seoul. Four months after that, 110,000 people. And then there was a last protest of 150,000 people, women and their allies taking to the streets in Seoul to protest, my life is not your porn. South Korea has made the most profound changes Um, uh, the government. So I advise the South, the digital um, sex crime information commissioner in South Korea. They have now a comprehensive approach to what they call as digital sex crime information. That's the, that's the conception that advocates wanted the government to adopt 
rather than trivializing it as Molka, and the government did. Um, they have new laws vis-a-vis -vis platforms that they have to take down and with utmost speed, uh, non-consensual intimate imagery. They also have programs for victims, support for um, work and housing. So what's so interesting is like a country that had you know, massive societal problems and still of course has problems with misogyny, which by the way is culturally very common. <laughs> misogyny is like everywhere. You know, the story I'm telling is unfortunately like there really isn't a country that's free from it. Um, but they've made some really serious strides in South Korea. So Kate, don't be so depressed, right? Like I, I too, I'm like, I'm not, Pol I mean, I'm a little Pollyannish, let's be frank. I am a little bit but I've seen change on the ground, right? And I've been part of it as vice president of the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative. My sort of partner in these things, Marian, Dr. Marian Franks and I have worked with lawmakers across the country. We now have, we went from two states criminalizing non-consensual intimate imagery to 48 states, DC and Guam and a federal bill. So not yet passed. So, you know, I, I'm not giving up. You know what I'm saying? Like Kate and I've worked with companies for the last 12 years We've seen some progress. I'm a little depressed about this Elon Musk, Musk nonsense, right? Uh, I think we're going to see a, a, a sad retreat from a lot of the good work that I've done with Twitter over the last 12 years. Um, but, you know, it's not all terrible. I hope that makes you a little feel a little better. Thank you. It does. Thank you very much, Jenny. Okay. So we've got a little less than 10 minutes left, and we've got several comments in the chat. And so what I'm going to try to do is combine some themes in the questions in the yeah, chat please. and see if we can uh, sort of sharpen a, a, a prompt for you to respond to. So I, I'm looking at comments uh, uh, just to make sure that people get credit for their their. Uh, their suggestions. Uh, Byamjun Bake, I apologize for probably mispronouncing your name. Uh, Alejandra uh, Soha, uh, Christopher. Uh, so the, the theme that I hear in these comments is on the one hand, you've obviously put a lot of emphasis on systems and structures, um, some of which are technical, some of which are normative, uh, that vary between the US and other countries or vary even on a broader, more regional or global scale. Uh, ecosystems is one way to capture part of that, uh, that sensibility. And on the other end of the spectrum, not really necessarily in conflict with the systems perspective, but uh, a separate theme that needs to be sort of identified and, and articulated relative to that is the focus on individuals and the focus on individual privacy and individual rights. Um, when you started your talk, the initial justification for your interest in this really focused on stories about individual identity, autonomy, uh, integrity, uh, especially bodily integrity, but not limited to that. But as you went on, when you get to the prescriptive part, talking about a civil rights framework, uh, that's a system level attitude, um, group level harms, probabilities uh, that, that trying to capture interests and harms that are not necessarily captured by a focus on individuals. So that, for example, yeah. The focus on a consumer protection identity where, you know, if you consent through a privacy policy, you've waived your interest in right. avoiding harm. And that's clearly sort of harming society as a whole, right. even while we kind of think that it's protecting individual um, decisional choice. Uh, we're protecting de decisional choice, but but uh, ignoring larger collective harms. So I, to, I think that theme comes through all of these yes. different comments. And I wonder if you could yes. sort of Absolutely. key you up to talk a little bit more about how you articulate the relationship in, yeah. in, in, in between sort of ideas of individuality, autonomy, identity, right. and this broader social right. system level vision that totally. you think that we should be paying attention to. So, so great friends. Thank you for, um, Mike, for your distilling them, but also um, a very, so astute, right? So the three pillars are the three values, right? The autonomy or sexual autonomy, identity value, the human dignity value, and that close relationships value, you know, all are at the heart of intimate privacy. Um, and there are times when our choice can be meaningful, right? Uh, particularly when it comes to individual relationships, right? Our choice is visceral. We can understand it. It's almost like it would be meaningful, right? Um, and we need to honor those individual choices. When it comes to companies and all sorts of collection of our information that we don't even know really is either being collected, that we don't know is being processed and shared, 
in my chapter on what we do vis-a-vis -vis companies, right? And how thinking of them as data stewards, I argue that there should be some limits for the good of society. We just can't sell it. I don't care how much you want to sell it, right? That is, there are, as my colleague, our wonderful friend, Anita Allen would say, there are some rules about privacy that may be unpopular to some, but are good for society as a whole. And so the in thinking through intimate information that's handled by first parties, that is when we can give permission to our dating app to use our information, right? Because we can hold them accountable. We know who they are, but should they be able to sell that information to what we call antiseptically third parties? And my answer in the book is absolutely not, right? We, we that is, our dating app should not be in the business of selling or sharing our intimate information with anyone. I don't care if we give consent, which is like weak. You know what I'm saying? Like we consent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to use this app. I'll just say anything. I'll agree. Right. Um, and so the there there is admittedly a tension, but even the, as I argue in the book, the individual consent story of when privacy violators are people, right? Not companies or governments that have a structural part of that story because the harm is structural, right? That is thanks to gender norms and stereotypes, invidious stereotypes, the cost to women, gender and sexual minorities and to um, you know, non-whites is much more profound, right? The notions of disgust of what your body is. So it's gonna be way more costless to you if your nude photo is posted online for a woman, a black woman, a, right? Um, a, a gay man than it would be for um, you know, a cisgender white man. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, and, um, heterosexual, sorry. Um, so the, I have included as well in the individual story, that is we ought to treat, uh, invasions of intimate privacy, um, and address the bias motivation that's often at the heart of them or recognize that. And as part of the penalty too. So, so yes, you're right that it's not really attention so much as there are times when consent, I think we shouldn't honor it, even if you don't want privacy too bad, you're getting it. So I think that's a great place to, uh, to bring the, the session to a close. Uh, before I, I formally thank Danielle, I just want to comment quickly uh, that she invoked uh, Anita Allen. Uh, the fabulous Anita Allen, who is, uh, yes, no, for all privacy scholars, uh, you know, Anita is uh, a real legend uh, and a pioneer. And I cannot resist noting that Anita Allen started her academic career at the University of Pittsburgh That's right. uh, before That's she right. moved to the University of Pennsylvania, where she has had a, a spectacular career. So um, there, there is, a, there's, as we like to say, there's always a Pittsburgh connection. I love uh, it. I love it. So uh, on that note, Danielle, thank you so much for uh, a, an inspiring as well as provocative talk. Uh, we all look forward to the to the publication of the book uh, in the fall and to following your work and your career um, going forward. These are obviously incredibly critical topics um, and extend in so many directions. So uh, a thousand thanks to you. Uh, and so thank you for having me. Yes. Applause. Uh, so I will unmute and thank you for uh, being with us today. Uh,